Hello and welcome to Diaphoria Worlds 2022 episode three. Of course, shout out before we begin to merch.riotgames.com providing us with some fancy Worlds merch. Cajal's Great. wearing some of it. There's a little block in front of you. Where's my pants? I wanted the pants. Yeah, yeah. I only got the hoodie. Is that? I only got the hoodie. I want the jacket. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you <laughs> get the pants, I'll get the jacket. Okay, okay. I'll get the pants. Give well, you guys can buy it at the venue or at merch.riotgames.com. <laughs> Which is weird that you don't know that yet because we said that at the start of every episode. It's mostly I you saying it, actually. That's true. But you're both forgiven because And before, usually we don't listen. No, if I was forgiven, I'd pick Caitlin and take their oh power in God. six minutes. <laughs> Guys, here's the thing. No, if you couldn't tell by now, we can tell by some, now. Some context here. Uh, it's been a bit of a, a situation with our lodging so far in Atlanta. Our hotel is severely understaffed. <laughs> they could barely even find rooms for us. Yeah, we arrived at 3 p.m. and then we had to sit there for like five hours waiting for rooms to be yeah. ready. So, um, so I was asleep. And the, end, the end result has been that no one has slept except for me. So we're d down a man because Isaac literally did I, not sleep. Isaac's supposed to be here. I got nobody. You guys are cuddling over here. That's I true. got, where's my cuddle buddy? It's nice and warm over here. Between but us, we have enough sleep for two adult males. Yeah. That's about it. I got like three and three hours. I think you got like a couple hours. Yeah. Nice. He's Dude, a couple you know, the walls there. are so thin that I can hear the elevator going up and down. I, Every single time it's cold. It's so annoying. The, I can just hear this the people in the room next to me are for sure getting a divorce. I, last <laughs> night I heard this woman's voice yelling, I never should have married you, lazy bastard. And I was like, and then the door slams is running down the hallway. That's like so we hear everything at this hotel. We're actually going crazy. Yeah. I just wish that we were next to like a pro team and we spoke the appropriate languages to hear comms. We could learn uh, about yeah. picks that were coming up. So we, we could be that, getting smarter that, instead of we crazier. We have that deep cut where no, we'd I'm be just, like, I'm I heard them over to him talking. Deft is definitely going to play this on that day. Yeah, yeah. You know? I'm just listening to how elevators work. He's learning about a divorce. Is there anything <laughs> you're learning about? No, I'm fine. I'm the only one of us who's sleeping fine. I put on like rain sounds. I got the air conditioner running at all hours of the night. Like I'm just drowning it all out. That's yep. a good idea, actually. And Azale's dead. <laughs> and Azale is alive, but yeah, unconscious. Hopefully at this very moment, finally getting some well-deserved sleep. So all of this is to say, because yeah. I promise you that this is still a League of Legends podcast and that this focus mm. is still Worlds 2022 is that... If it gets a little weird today, as it already has, just bear with us. Yeah, um, we like, are. Me and the, like the sleep deprived worlds cast you had last year. Yes, yeah. remember that? which is iconic. Yeah, so, and people do want that. I just don't know. We know that the people who have listened to the cast want it. I we just can, don't know if the die for you. We can share that same it. brain cell again. We've always got that brain. <laughs> but now cell. we have to place it between three. <laughs> oh, oh no, no, only two because I'm he's fine. fine. Okay, he's That's fine. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> me and Mark on that one brain cell. <laughs> Let's go. I feel so like, I feel like a chaperone. Anyway, uh, last week. We had some of the greatest quarterfinals of all time. But before we get to the greatest quarterfinals of all time, let's get through the um, mandatory 3-0s. One of them unexpected, one of them very much expected, although, Cadre, you predicted again. So let's start with JDG versus Rogue. Um, <laughs> you're the EU pundit. Yeah, this, you predicted hey, Rogue to stuff. win. So do you want to talk to us a little bit about why you thought yeah. Rogue would win? And well, like walk what us did through happen? the logic. I felt like people were doubting Rogue too much and European yeah. fans were turning on their team. And you never do that to G2 and Fnatic, but it happened to Rogue. Yeah. So I tried to rally the troops. White Knight. To get them ready and drop the 3-0 Rogue prediction just so people would sit up in their chair and be like, yeah, fuck yeah, Rogue, let's go. You did. You, you rallied. It's the like, you know, the office, like, do, 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 do. Yeah, what is yeah, it yeah. the song? When it's like, you know, something happens and it's like written by, and it's just like really funny. Oh, it's, it's like curb, your, curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, 3-0. Okay, that's copyright. That's kind of what happened. Yeah. Kind of what happened. Um, you rallied the troops and then led them to get massacred. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I think it was like, if Rogue took a game, that would be impressive already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To me at least. Like the way JDG's been playing this tournament, the way Kanavi and 369 have been playing especially, it was really hard for Rogue to find wins. And like in the interview afterwards, Odo and Larson were saying that some of the games were winnable. And I think especially game I three. I think they were, yeah. Game three yeah. was in a state Actually. where it was winnable because of the, their comp was fine and the Blanc was ahead and their bot lane was winning. Yeah. Um, but JDG just kind of like, JDG is the one team in the LPL that <laughs> never really gets big early game leads. Mm. And the way they win games is through mid to late game um, We've already over-indexed a lot in their team fighting, but their macro is really good. Yeah. They're really good at cross-mapping when they're even or behind um, to make it so they're actually going even trades despite the gold disadvantage. What do you pick against Zayas? What do you pick against 369? The top laners on this side of the bracket are insane, you know? I mean, and we kind of set it up going into yeah, it. Yeah, and we're, we're like, talking about it. This is the if gauntlet. Odo makes it all the way through this bracket, mm. you know? I think the, the one thing in that matchup is um is Aatrox, right? If both sides ban it, then 
happy days. But if yeah. like T1 leave it open on red side, then they pick Zeus's Fiora into it and wins against 369 trucks. Yep. That's just serious breaking because now yeah. JDG have to permanent banning trucks. Or they could try it in game two and, and this then is, on red side, they could be the ones to leave it open and then they could play 369. But this is, this is how I know that this man has just like let this series go already. As you're like, ooh, Oda Wamne, the bracket. And he's like, yeah, no, 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 I hear you. Zayas first 369. So anyway, <laughs> moving forward, you just want to like let it go. I feel like okay. you just like, it happened. EU is dead now and I want to move on. I don't want to linger in the trauma. I want to talk about literally anything yep. else. It, it was for, for 369 though, it was so cool though because he had so many answers to the, the rogue style, right? So let's, let's do rogue their justice of, you know, they really, and, and all of EU had locked in yep. uh, at the beginning of, of groups and stuff you know, on this, on this style, using Maokai and these tank tops really well um, and, and playing to uh, these aggressive mm. bottom lanes and stuff. But 369 had multiple counters for it. You know, he bopped him with the Gwen for, for split push and scaling for later. Mm. Then also bopped him in tank versus tank mm -hmm. with the Orn in, solo kill Orn, Maokai, yeah. Orn into Maokai, which by the way, we had seen a bunch of times. Yeah. And I already had been like, Wow, I feel like teams should actually just play tank to tank and let let it go through because Orn with Brittle has just been turbo stomping the Maokai's mm -hmm. in lane. Yeah, I don't actually know how the matchup goes because Maokai is like percent damage as well in his Q, right? So I actually don't but, know how. But that... every time I've seen it, it has been so heavy Orn favored. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. like, it, it must. Yeah. I mean, Orn Orn does win most tank matchups. I think yeah. like Sion he wins, Maokai he wins. I think Gragas is like skill matchup because of the E of Gragas interaction and the W, yeah. uh, but it's definitely probably Orn favorite if you play it right. I also just think that like a lot of the value of Maokai is in the sapling and the empowered sapling, like a certain amount of power in the kit is there and it's just not really a viable The annoying tool. vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like annoying vision, which feels great when you're a jungler. It feels great early game because you vision access or it helps you clear camps, but it's like, unless the Orn is just like, yeah, I'm gonna face tank this bush you've been stacking saplings in, you're basically playing the the 1v1 with one less ability. Now, admittedly, yeah. the sustain on the passive, the passive for Maokai is in, in, infinitely more valuable in the early game, but Orn just seems like he smacks. Could also be a 369 thing, but we did talk to Odo uh, a little bit after the series, and I think that like people are talking a lot about how far down he was in game three, and I think it was a combination of obviously 369 being good, but also Odo felt like he was making a lot of unforced errors. So I don't know if that is like the master class in that laning matchup and what we should take leaning forward, but I will say that the longer the tournament has gone on, the less and less impressive Maokai has been. And I think partially that's team skill. Probably because it loses every game now. It loses every game now, <laughs> yeah. But also, like, I feel like people figured out the alt. I think that like when when the alt, well, when people were busting out the alt in the early games, like no one knew what to do and it was just winning every fight straight up. And now people are just like, all right, we're just going to wait for you to throw it and then we're going to back up. I think even more fine. so than that is like everyone's picking Silas when you have it on the other enemy team. And they're like, we also have the ult. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have an Great. ult with more AP, What's better gold now? income, and now a better champion. I've got a Maokai on my team that kills you too. Great. What do yeah, you I think there's a few things off the top of my head why I think Maokai like kind of fell off a bit. Number one is uh, like the difference in the bot meta from group stage to now. Like there's not many more Kalistas and such. Uh, it's more evolved into like range support meta with like yeah. Dushin Nami, Aphelios, Lulu, Sivir Yumi. Yeah. Um, that, that was going to be one thing I was going to bring up for uh, JDG moving forward. Mm -hmm. Like our takeaways for all of the quarters moving forward to their semifinal matchups. Yeah. Um, you know JDG with the with the three zero. One of the things they haven't had to face is the what probably started with the Korean uh, scrim meta was these pushing bottom lanes you're talking about, where it's like Heimer, <laughs> these like double poke lanes yep. um, with with all this As pushing power because versus Rogue, like they were, Rogue was still playing the Lucia Nami Callista, like try and like win your lane, um, look for uh, all in kills, mm. lane bully stuff, and. JDG hasn't had to play it yet, and all the teams remaining in the tournament are these Korean teams that have obviously been scrimming each other because they all are are pulling out these style. That, that's another topic now. I want to touch on a little bit later, yeah. like the scrim culture, because there's three LCK teams and one LPL, right? So you yeah. can really bully them into a corner. Uh, but I'll get on that in a second. So the other Maokai points I had just had was um, I felt like the Maokai tops especially weren't facing Eastern top laners who could punish it enough to like merit a lane lead because Eastern teams are really good at getting side lane advantages on carry tops and then playing like side push into mid and just engaging on you first, like yeah. Lawrence, Camille, for example. Yeah. Um, uh, so as Zeus' GP, for example, as well. Um, and they're just really, really good at that. So the longer the tournaments evolved, the Maokai struggled against better and better top laners. Also, I think Rogue just had one style. It was just tank top, yep. pushing bot, carry bot, rely on them, mage, mid, early game jungler. 
That's yeah. the plan, and it's never going to change. We're never going to play Graves Jungle or a Carry Jungle or Belveth, so there's never really threat in draft. Never going to count pick top with like a Fiora, so there's no threat in top lane either. All you have to do is manage bot lane and just pick <laughs> counters in every lane if you can, because they're going to blind everything, and that's it. Just ban Jarvan or something. Like there's no real other solution. Yeah. Like Rogue don't have any other styles. That's the problem they had. And I tried to kind of pick with Fiora against the Eastern <laughs> top laners. So we we are the example of what happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you tried? We're, yeah, we're reminded. We like watched your game. We're like, you saw that? You're like, ah, I'm not like, we'll, like, we'll stick to the it's, it's like you're holding out because you're like, well, if I never try, they'll never know how bad it would have gone. So we can always say, whoops, we did. Oh, we should have, but we yeah. didn't pick Fiora instead of we picked it and we got absolutely blasted. Uh, the contrast is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because you have like the West who was playing tank tops and more defining rogue here because we're talking about quarterfinals. Yeah. The East who is playing tanks and carries top mostly. Yep. You have the East playing carry junglers. You have the yep. East playing melee skirmish mids like Akali Silas early rotations or Lissandra and the West is playing Azir LeBlanc as much as they can. Um, and then the only difference is that the only defining part of what the West actually did to dictate the meta is the Lucian Nami because yeah. I think Rogue or, or Fnatic, I don't know who it was, the European team was the first one to pull it out and yeah. all the Eastern yeah. teams are like, wait, Lucian Nami is good again? That's the only driving factor that Europe or, or the West had. Normally it's comes from success internationally the west is like in, in, innovative picks yeah or like off meta picks that the yep. east either can't deal with they can't find accounts to or they struggle to play themselves and i feel like the east is the ones doing that now with the ash heimerdinger with the silas akali with the carry tops like the west can't keep up with their innovation and their meta so the, those moments are what i love most about international tournaments you know those are some of the best series that we've ever had is when you get those innovative and a lot of the times it actually comes from support role um, picks, you know, like the the misfortune Asira with the T1 Rocks Tiger series. Yep. You know, greatest of all time. Um, now we're getting all these, the evolution of the bottom lane, it's, you know, moving well, forward from the list. They're like dissecting it. It's like, oh, Ash Heimerdinger's broken. Let yeah. me try Syndra support. Let's see if that yeah. works. Uh, I guess the only thing I'll just say is quickly is the Lucian Nami was one thing the West mm -hmm. did. The Kalista Soraka as well that Rogue have been doing. I think the Eastern team yeah. are picking up a little bit on as well. So I guess those the only two Good driving job, forces Trendy. that Europe had. Also <laughs> the they, Nasus one though. <laughs> yeah. So TLDR individually outclassed by flexibility yeah. and yep. uh, just wider and deeper champion pools and more of a direct meta of like just skirmish heavy. So your scaling never yeah. really comes to fruition because they're mid game stronger. The flexibility has always been one of the issues that we struggle with. I feel like because so many of the Eastern players play autofill up to like rank one challenger yeah while they're playing solo queue you know Can canyon's up there fucking he's playing mid lane he's even playing it in competitive exactly last year or two he's years blasted ago. away it's like what do we do when this he's not even flexibility within his own role <laughs> like the, the, this man can get rank one playing well, other roles and stuff and you're just like um you know, I wish we had more strategies to pull from. And it's like, well, it definitely helps when you're that well trained, you know? I just, uh, yeah, I feel like the, the greatest situation for the West ever is a ludicrously static meta that like you get to break a little bit. You know what I mean? That just just like, oh, we, we found this one edge. But the problem is, is that every single team is experimenting and doing creative things, finding mm -hmm. these creative avenues and answers. And what's even more exciting as we move forward, and I don't want to talk too much about semis quite yet because we got a lot of quarters to go ahead. It's like individual, like we will have match and best of five metas mm -hmm. be so completely unique from one another. And it was absolutely the case in quarterfinals. And if we shift our attention over to RNG T1, you saw that there because suddenly Lissandra goes from not existing in any other best of five mm -hmm. to being highly contested by both Shahu and Faker because of how these teams want to play. And like, that's the shit I love. Like when every single player's individual preferences have yeah. to be taken into account and it's not just blanket like ardent meta, blanket Azir meta. Cause I was yeah. so nervous that we were gonna have a, a tournament full of just like Azir Victor or Azir Oriana yeah. after week the, one groups, I was terrified. And, and, and this year we've actually been rewarded with like one of the best and uh, most diverse metas mm -hmm. of all time. My last little thing, and uh, uh, you can move on, on the like innovation, you know, uh, Western look is that our greatest, some of our greatest successes have been when we fully embraced picks like that. You know, G2, the height of G2 and their dominance was when they could play Pike in every lane and and they had this feared flexibility from, mm. from, from all teams. And for NA, it's when CLG at MSI, when they got to finals, they were the ones setting the meta Aurelian for Soul. supports. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, Aurelian Soul, and then Aframu Bard. with with all the uh, with the Enchanter supports, yeah. pulling out the Sona and all, and all that type of stuff. I just think like, in a, 
those magical years when we can be the ones latching onto something and like playing it, playing it the best. And mm -hmm. then other teams are trying to catch up is, yeah, the, is, is the dream. The but, G2 Pike thing is, is like the first thing you think of. Yeah. Uh, but there's also like the Mage Bots. They were playing Syndra. They were playing Zoe AD yeah. Terry. Uh, they were playing a Kali Flex on one, two, Irelia Flex. Sorry Ace to divert, flex. buddy. No, you're uh, fine. They, they were, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like literally jump on any chance to talk about G2 our, 2019. Our, our, our one brain yeah. cell yeah. Our one is brain cell like, got distracted. I have, to, like, I have to like guide it. Put your yeah. one brain cell on a leaf. Like, oh my gosh, I'm talking about this now. No, um, you're fine. Finish your point. Yeah, no, Pike was the first one. But you think of all those yeah. mages, both those Flex solo laners that they had as well. And that's where like the innovation came from. It wasn't yeah. until like four or five when you knew what G2's draft was exactly. really good. I just looked it up there, but it was, it was last year. Canyon was playing mid. Maorang was a jungler. Yeah. They 2 0'd Afrika. They 2 0'd DRX. He was playing Akali and Rise and Set. So you talk about players playing roles at a very high level. Canyon's an example. Zhao, who's another example, right? Um, this flexibility can either come yeah. from 1v1ing your opposing laner or your, your own mid laner um, or, or just playing autofill or playing loads of different well, roles or just being so good at, at the, the end game of the day, that you can just, play it to any of the Just champions. live League of Legends and just play it all the time and yeah. play all roles. Nothing, and, there's nothing else but <laughs> League of Legends. And everything. It's true though, because Eastern teams do three block a lot, I think. I yeah. don't know how much, mostly probably through playoffs, but the amount of scrims that Eastern teams do versus Western teams do is a lot higher. I think Western teams value um, mindset and not burning out as much. And in, in, in the East, from like the interviews <laughs> I've seen, as blunt as it sounds, they don't believe in burnout. They just keep yeah. going. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I don't want to get into that. I'm not going to get into that thing. one, dude. Yeah, it's a long discussion, but um, also not going to potentially misrepresent the philosophy. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the full story of how like the LPL and LCK team scrims go. I just know they do very often three blocks towards the end of like playoffs, especially. Well, and regardless of how they're getting there, they're obviously getting there in Canyon. I think obviously a player as a jungler, I feel like you're always rewarded for learning how every role and every lane works because it makes it so much easier for you to understand yeah. where you need to be and how you need to play. And Canyon is such a great example of a player who is yeah. who is like that, who can be successful anywhere. And it wouldn't surprise me if there's a lot more players who obviously aren't going to actually swap to mid in a pro game like yeah. Canyon did. But shifting again, here we go, yeah. guys. I'm bringing the brain cell. Yeah. Attempt number two. The brain cell is on me. Single like brain, brain cell. You know that move one. where they're on the freeway and then the car is like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you guys. Yeah, exactly. That's you guys. I feel like I'm the your like driving instructor with my own set of brakes yeah, and my yeah. own wheel, and I'm just slamming the brake truck. Oh, the so meme hard. with the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I had to pass. I had to pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brake was in the air. Now we got it. Now we got it. <laughs> T1 RNG. This is my transition point. Hilariously, and I said this in cast, it felt like game two was literally a 2019 G2 game from T1. Oh. RNG should have won that game. Yeah, RNG should have won that, won that game so Johnny hard. Case, yeah. That was ridiculous. They traded Cloud Soul for Baron. Yes. I, I just remember seeing a team fight where the Jace did like 6.5k damage yep. when yeah. he's, he's and he was, he was like, Yeah, exactly. He was 0 6 or like 1 7 or some shit at Zayus that time. Jace was getting absolutely camped the entire game, getting blasted at every opportunity, and then still did 7k damage. In a team and he was fight. still laughing too. Every time they went to his camera after he went this sixth death, it was like, but, <laughs> oh, they got me again. This game to me was like, game two especially was the most inspiring game in terms of like having faith in T1 moving forward, especially looking at what could be a, like a Gen G going yeah. up against them in the finals. And remember from LCK finals, obviously a super one-sided matchup because this like, the absolute pace you have to play with a composition like that to make really snap decisions to like, constantly be forcing RNG under the back foot. Their RNG is responding to you because you're making two plays at the same time and they basically have to pick one. That game was macro wise in this series, at least my favorite game to watch just because that game was one. And like you said, playing, that game was over. They were playing some of these super difficult comps with like no front line, you know, and then mm -hmm. everybody's range and yeah. damage. And so it's, it's, it's almost like one of those wow arenas where you're going full range comps and you have to like focus fire closest target. And when one person kites back, whoever's getting focused, like everyone has to DPS to get the, you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. cover fire yeah. basically off of them. It was, it was super cool to watch them execute on some of these. And even just some of the dodging that went on in this series, you know, Faker like sidestepping a Sejuani that's right next to him yeah, the QW and, and tries to tries to QW and Faker just this little sidesteps. Mm -hmm. that, that is so freaking hard to do. And Bro. he's doing it. Caria is doing it. Caria is doing it. Caria is Tom Gain Kent. three Tom Kent, Woo! the thickest hitbox in the world. This, this big old frog is coming through. He's making <laughs> them look like clowns over there, juking them. A little I had step. a dream that night after the series that, that Faker, Faker wins. I, I had a dream. He's raising the cup again. He does it in NA. Again, he's won every single time in It would in be NA. crazy if Faker wins again, you know? He just yeah. lists the trophy again. It's 10 years since, or like nine years since he first Insane. won and then he wins again. Um, that game too, though, huge shout out to Gumayushi. Like, oh, yeah. 
there was a lot of doubts coming into I mean I had a lot of doubts coming into to Worlds especially yeah. because his his regular season performance was very hit or miss if you want to contextualize it he had two big flaws I think number one was in this very severe Lucian Nami meta AD carries with the dash especially he would either make a mistake in lane so that affects carrier either losing his flash taking a bad trade force enemy team stacks the wave and dives him or he would dash too far forwards in team fights or never dash at all so he either dash in and die or he'd never dash at all so I felt like he struggled a lot to adapt to this hyper carry meta yeah. but now at Worlds he seems a lot more consistent he looks very comfortable on things like you know uh, the Zaya especially like that was the one game around the Elder Dragon where he just kind of won the game and carry as well like that hostile takeover on the Elder Dragon it was a five man if the Fjord didn't W um, yeah, yeah. so despite them being behind I think the bot lane like leveraged enough to carry the top side which is very rare for T1 if yeah. you think of like the way T1 functioned last year Kana was strong side only half the gank top owner would do full clear into lane gank top every single game <laughs> yeah. so he was like in the hyperbolic time chamber of being into by his top laner but also being a magnet and sucked up towards the top lane so bot lane never got really much of resources because <laughs> the Kana hyperbolic was... time chamber of being into by his top <laughs> yes, laner yeah because <laughs> I, want, I want that on a shirt <laughs> <laughs> because because Kana would either die a lot if his top mm. if his jungler wasn't around or he would get like an even or a head lead um yeah. with owner being around the best example of that is damn t1 when it's um I don't know if it's game one or game two, when Kana's playing Jace against Khan's Lucian. Yeah. Owner plays topside only, gets Kana's Jace ahead, bottom mid suffer for it, and they fall behind and lose. And now he's got a top laner that is reliable enough to carry. But in games like this where it falls apart, then bot has to pick it up, and this time they did. So I think that's really well, important for T1. And I think course. the other thing that was big too for me was, I thought he was doing, I thought Guma was doing well, and Guma and Carrie were doing really well. But some part of me was like, oh... It's a Felios meta. He's doing great on a Felios. He's always been comfortable on a Felios. You know, it's like it's clear that a lot of people are scaling or trending more towards these scaling picks and options. And that was something that I was generally like keeping track of. But to be honest with you, we saw the Ashheimer, very unique lane, obviously need practice on it to make it work. Now, to be fair, the first few levels are pretty straightforward. You just zone them because Volley is the dumbest ability in the game. But obviously, as the game goes on, you need to be very aware of how that lane functions. And then rounding, going into the Zaya, going into the, um, the TK Varus, like... They've, they've shown enough of a breath now that I have a, a ton of faith in this T1 yep. bot lane as they look ahead to their next series. And that was that was one of the question marks for me. The other one was Zayus. And obviously... You had a question mark on Zayus? Well, I wanted to see how good he would be just in terms of like overall. Like, could he be yeah. the best top laner in the world? And especially remember that we started with him busting out the Jace and it would be like, oh my God, the ultimate challenge, Zayus, yeah, yeah, Jace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah! And then he got blasted for like a lot yeah, of the yeah, game. Yeah. And then immediately he <laughs> came back. So understand that like, I've been on a roller coaster ride in terms of faith in Zayus, but like every single time the man has, yeah. has delivered. Yeah, um, one quick thing. Uh, the, the Ash Heimendinger, I liked it from T1. The only problem is if you actually watch the game, Bot lane was very even at 15 minutes. Like yeah, the Aphelios yeah. lane was actually dead even. They got they lost like a plate. Uh, carry us first to a Herald play, but then Viego got a triple kill anyway. Uh, it was mostly top side that carried that. So as much as I liked the Heimerdinger Ash, I didn't see the amount of value I've seen it happen from teams like DRX. But I think another good sign is the Kalista as well. We've seen there's a lot yeah. of flexibility out of T1's bot. Yeah, lane. because Barrel is actually a really good Heimerdinger player. Yeah, he he, he is landing every combo. You know, he's like as he's he's preemptively like shooting off the the grenade, then dropping the turret so it gets the laser charge like first the shot and stuff. Yeah. He's yeah, he, he's actually really good. So um, it definitely does take some time, but I really really feel like these. You know, especially Caria and actually all, all the Korean supports, Caria Lehens and Barrel have been the big difference makers in in the LCK versus LPL matchups. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, with the flexibility, and I feel like I'm everyone's looking for the the next leap as well for for bottom lane and like trying to come up with with the counters or like other big pushing um, you know support uh, matchups for this. Um, I do think, as far as the the Gumayushi point too. He is going to continue to play well. People are waiting for him to drop back down to summer. His summer was so bad that he actually got a lot of haters and everyone's just waiting to jump back on the hate train. But confidence does so much. If you, this, the rest of this T1 team besides Faker are the youngest four players. Mm -hmm. um, besides... I think there's a couple of there's players, one, but they're in the top five. They're, they're, they're four, of the, four of the five youngest players. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, my brain cell, can't think of it right now. Do you want to pat? Because Mark was using it. Oh, no. <laughs> but but, but, just, but like, the confidence. They're young. Back Very to the young. point. The confidence for Gumayushi is, is, is such a big deal, you know, mm -hmm. because we knew he could play at, play at this level. And after 
three owing. Uh, I, I just feel like him playing so well, he's gonna ha- he's gonna have so much confidence snowballing off of this mm. uh, and being able to continue it. So I, I really feel like this was such a good stepping stone for T1. It's exactly what they needed because Guma with Guma with, with full confidence like this and, and and playing well turns this team into a completely different team. Like I just, you're saying, they don't have to rely yeah, on Zayas anymore. I think the individual performances were great across the series. Again, the turnaround for I'm still blown away by the turnaround for Zayas in that Jace game. I always know that Jace on three items can one shot people, but I spend most of my career casting Jace games where he does nothing. Like if he loses early, he does nothing. Mm. Maybe that's just the EUNA life. I don't know, but this was crazy, crazy turn. And the execution, like that game two required every single person to be on the same page to outmatch RNG. RNG had way better engage options. RNG had way better setup. And the fact that they were able to pull them around the map and outmaneuver them was, was they absolutely just outclassed RNG across the series. And this was one of the series where I was like, there was a lot of series I expected to be three O's. This was not on my radar as a potential 3-0. One, one thing I will say about the Guma Yushi point is the reason I think he got a lot of haters was because him and Carrier were regarded as the best bot lane in the mm-hmm. world in, in MSI area, spring. Also last year towards Worlds, they were regarded as one of the best bots in the world. So relative to like what he was performing at and expectations, it's understandable that people would kind of question and you know doubt Guma Yushi, and, uh, Guma Yushi more, so not so much Carrier. Um, so I think it was merited in that sense because he was underperforming in summer versus what the best AD carry or bot lane in the world would look like. Yeah. But now they're they're up to form. A little bit worried about the Ash Heimendinger. Not sure how they would execute against like a similar bot lane when the matchup is so one sided. But you don't get a huge advantage. The only other concern I have for T1 is Faker. Um, I think the LCK mids right now are insane at Silas. Zeka and Chovy, their Silas is insane. <laughs> Faker Silas has left a lot to be desired. I think he's won most of his games on it, but. When I watch his lane phase against the Kalis, he's down in CS. He has to like force roams or his 1v1 mm-hmm. is weak or he's getting pushed in. Whereas when he plays a Kali into Silas, he looks very confident. Yeah. Um, so I'm unsure how the Silas conundrum will unfold. That's one of the biggest pivot points for mid lane because we had like originally Azir yeah. um, being most first picked as like the main control mage, but both Silas and Akali are good into it. So mm-hmm. Silas is like that pivot point between the two matchups because Silas will outscale Akali. Yeah. So if you don't make some shit happen in the first item, basically. Yeah, I, I think his Akalis look good, his Lissandra, and he's very flexible. I think there's a lot of champs we'll see from him, especially when he sees Chovy play Rise. I think Faker will be like, yeah. yeah, I can bust that out. Just his Silas is my only worry. But talking about RNG quickly as to why they faltered, um, I think the game two, their top side was incredibly far ahead, but their biggest mistake was this Elder Dragon. They had both their solo laners top, contesting at tier three, and they TP'd really late to the fight. They had, they had, yeah, they had they... really big pressure points. They could either push to end if T1 wants to contest, or they can TP in first to stop them getting in. These are the two things they had to do. They had so much vision around the bot side jungle. You either stop them entering bot yeah. side jungle, or you threaten the end. They did neither. They let them walk through the bot side jungle and then TP it, in to make it a 5v5. It was so bad. I think especially bad from Xiaohu. I think Xiaohu should have been the one to start it. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I think RNG made a big blunder there. And also, the game won, I can kind of see why they fell behind, because what happened was, if you rewatch the game, Wei gets a triple kill on Herald, right? All of them die. Wei then bases, but top wave's bouncing, and Wei goes to his bot camps to clear, and owner, when he respawns, just runs top and dives, yep. um, dives, breathe under his tower on Renekton. He loses an entire wave, doesn't have TP, and now top's over. So despite jungle being ahead, Wei just kind of let his top laner die on a bouncing wave. Yep. Maybe they thought he wasn't diveable, but from that point onwards, that was like a game changer. And Camille is just really far ahead, and your bot already has push. Well, so I think RNG- I remember that moment, and I could see owner owner being like, "Oh man, this guy's top top camps are all gone. I'm gonna go I- immediately regain because just instantly he's definitely base. gonna yeah he's definitely gonna be going clear this uh, blue quadrant. But like you're saying, Wei could have gone to cover that if he had the foresight." Mm. That put, yeah. that put their top side, even though their jungle was ahead, that put their top side really far behind. And when you're yeah. playing Viego with pushing lanes into you, it's really hard to make plays because they get deep vision, Graves wins 1v1, yep. and they have Umbral Glaive, so you can't contest River. Well, so. they've got Umbral Glaive and they have much, much better wave clear. Because they have a Victor, which is really just really easy to clear out waves. They've got the Heimerdinger Ash, so they have full control of mid 90% of the game. It made it so easy for them to do stuff. And on top of that, like when you did see RNG try to force a pick, like everything has to go on one person to get value out of the Viego being like 301 or yeah. 401 after that Herald fight. And they like, I have never seen a Viego get like a, a triple and then just be completely useless. And I just think it's partially because of that small play. But then credit to T1, they literally never gave that man an opportunity to like pick off a single member or like burst yeah. down a single player. 
Um, and like the Zanyas buys this game, the armor buys this game, just made so much of that lead. And what I thought would be a game ending fuck up around Harold, just be not relevant at all. Yeah, dude, I, that reminded me of the point that I had wanted to make when you're talking about the Ashheimer Dinger lane before. And even if they're not turbo blasting bottom lane, it does so much to tilt jungle matchup to have these hawk shots coming yep. through and still and always having bottom lane pushing. It makes it so easy to to go for invades and and track enemy jungle so that they can't have these these ganks to tilt some of these solo these solo lane matchups yep. that are so important. Yeah, and that, that rely on kill pressure. It's even more annoying if you actually factor in the fact that. They push in a wave by ignoring the enemy bot. They run into river. They place Heimer turrets in your jungle, similar yeah, to Maokai saplings. They shoot hawk shots across the map. And also that Herald fight that they lost, if you actually watch how the Heimerdinger functions, he has perma push so he can be there first, which mm -hmm. he was. But also the arrow up river is always going to hit in a Herald fight. You're going to shoot it directly up a river when the Herald's about to start and there's four before. You're guaranteed to hit someone. In that case, they hit breathe and it almost turned the fight. But yeah. you can see how much value it brings in terms of like affecting the rest of the map, finding the enemy jungle. And I think that's what's the most valuable out of it. Yes, you can get plates and CS leads, but information is a really powerful thing in League. So I think that's what helped a lot. Do you want to talk about now the T1 versus JDG matchup after this, or do all the quarterfinals in a row? Let's talk about T1 JDG because I would I would hate bus driver. Can I just say one more thing on this T1 RNG Yeah, you say, two, say please, please. So game one really struggled with pushing lanes into them. Game two was the big throw where they had a really easy. I think it was two big goal. macro mistakes because the trading cloud for the yeah, Baron was also, also that, that gave valuable. so much gold to T1. Yeah, and I don't also, think they would have been able to fight it. When, if, you're, when you're behind and you get Baron, you can slow the game down so much. It's because insane. They can never push in waves. Yeah. Super creep stop siege really easily. Yeah, it was those um, two macro together. And you also have nothing to threaten over, right? Like there's nothing they're scared of from leaving their base. Yep. And then game three, I think RNG just fell apart. Like you could see Wei and his frustration and these engages they were doing mid onto Faker would just didn't make much sense. Like they were overforcing when they had numbers disadvantage. I think they were kind of, I hate saying this about a team, but they were kind of out of it. Like mentally, they were just really out of it. I mean, just into T1 and a T1 was outplaying them. Like Keria after that Tam Kench play mid when he when he like dodged both those skill shots <laughs> and then he double knocked up both carries under a tier two yeah, dive. Yeah, and I like, said this he in was cast, playing but like, out of his mind. You Keria. forget how ludicrously OP Tom Kench base stats are because in these ranged matchups he like rarely does anything without a jungler showing up. But Carrier reminded us just that I still just see that stupid Tom Kench animation as he waddles his way into mid lane just oh yeah. knocking people up left and right taking I, heads and he's just like 1v1ing the jungler and yeah. you're like oh my god. I, <laughs> I just wonder what the series would look like if uh, if RNG won that game too, or if it would be more competitive, because I expect I, more from RNG in this yeah. series. But I can't. This is one of those series where I can't tell if T1 is insane or if RNG just blundered. I, right now, I'm leaning towards RNG blundering. I, I think it's both. Yeah, I because mm. I think that like game one, because T1 blundered around that Herald fight in the first place. Because mm. I don't think they needed to risk that against Fiego. Because again, the second the resets start coming through, it feels rough. And obviously, RNG should have taken that mistake and ran with it. But then the way T1 played out the rest of the game was yeah, so damn clean. I remember and it's, it's always going to be a bit of both, yeah. but I want to give credit T1, T1 credit in game one and in game two. Yep. Um, game three was a slaughter. Like I, if we never talk about game three again, I'm fine with that because game three was so, other than being a highlight reel, was so ludicrously one-sided in terms of play, they even execution. Even with Tom Kench when they're countered by Soraka. Yeah. I remember who the other young player <laughs> player is. The, it's, the, it's the four T1 members besides Faker and Zekka. Is it Zeka, is it? Zeka, oh. Yeah, Zeka's like 18 or 19. I think he's is 19. He a baby? Is it, no, he's no, a baby. Yeah. yeah, he's 19. Oh, yeah, because he first started um, playing like a when, man. Uh, when Coma took him over to, to LPL when he was 17. Yeah, he played Anyways. two years in LPL and BLG, I think. So I think that the way we can do this now is we can shift our attention towards this first semifinal just because we've talked about both these teams and I think these ideas are fresh in people's heads and I don't want to yeah. be calling back to We don't want to have to move our ago. brain cell too far. Yeah, I got to keep you guys like one track. <laughs> we're going to finish this section of the bracket and then we're going to go to the uh, other section of the bracket. So I let's, like let's talk about JDG T1. <laughs> okay, so my main takeaway for JDG is what are they going to do about bottom lane? Because everybody knows top lane is actually a clash of gods. Mm. 369 versus Zeus, that, that is going to be insane. That is going to be so exciting. Yes, it's going to depend a lot on draft and a lot of focus is going to be there. But I think the unseen question, because JDG hasn't had to deal with this other like power struggle over pushing Heimerdinger, double poke uh, bottom lane, bottom lane matchups is how will they deal with it versus T1? Because clearly all the LCK teams have been screaming against each other. They all have put in some time on the Ashheimer Dinger, whether some some of the bottom lanes are better than others mm -hmm. at using it. Sure, yeah. This is gonna start you thinking about 
um, the other supports. Like I was, uh, Corey JJ was streaming last night and I was talking to him about it and I was like, what else? He was like, Zyra is, is like Heimerdinger, but better. So the Core JJ is on this big Zyra bottom. And if you remember, Ash now, Zyra was the original. And counter Zyra. Exactly. Yeah. That, this is the, the we're puzzle com unfolds. We're coming this is full where the circle, baby. So, so the, the Zyra could be an answer. Um, Jin also from the AD carry perspective has always been uh, one of the answers that you could take it when you're doing like double poke lanes because Jin has such quick uh, trades mm. with auto Q uh, and the and the CC setup for the W's because the other weakness is getting ganks off and if you have Jin yeah. lane then you can always set up ganks there and if you can crack that then you can start pushing back the other way but um, I Caria Caria is my favorite support. Um, because he is so diverse. Him and Lehens are my two favorite because they play all this weird ass shit. And yeah. so I just started going like, okay, so and you know, maybe <laughs> like Soraka and Zyra are probably the most likely to be answers to Heimerdinger, but Karia is undefeated on Nico support, an another poke bottom lane that also has Calista also Nico. has root setups Bro, for Calista ganks. Calista Nico has been talked about for so long. It, like I, I, I started going down the super deep rabbit hole because T1 are so flexible and Karia could literally, he's, Sorry, I hate what to is this no, face just, you just, just made. I just, I just remembered something. Why you just clenched your mouth just, like you wanted to fight just him? Pop it off. I was playing a solo queue game. Nico supports on any team. I'm telling you. He hex portaled over the Baron pit while ulting, landed it and stole it, and came out the other end of the hex. It's portal. gonna happen. It's gonna happen. I just wanted okay. to say that because it made me really mad and it stole my Baron. <laughs> Carry on. Um, okay. What was the other one? I had some more weird ass Karyo ones, but um, but I think I think it's stuff. just regardless of what the evolution looks like. And I'm with you, and I want to yeah. actually really want to see Nico Callista because I love that alt interaction. It's yeah. so stupid. But the thing that we haven't really seen from Hope and Missing, and maybe this is partially because of who they played against, because Rogue were very much locked into what I think we can call the group stage meta of bot lane as just a simple label for it. We haven't seen how deep their crazy goes, if they have anything, if they're ready to play this stuff. And remember when we look back at the Rogue series, talking to Betty, talking to Lore, like one of the avenues that the Rogue believers were like, okay, maybe this is somewhere we can attack is hope and missing because these are guys who are prone to slipping up in some of the early states of the game who will die in the 2v2, who will die in the laning phase. And like, if you die against the Heimerdinger Ash bottom lane, you're not playing the game for like, 25, 30 minutes, yeah. you know? Like it does not get easier if you give a kill to that lane. That's why I think the spotlight should definitely be on top lane. Yes. Those are the gods of top lane. This is the battle for best top laner in the world. Mm. <laughs> but damn, if bottom lane isn't so interesting. It's like, you know what it feels like? It's like it's like Captain America versus whoever up on the top side of the map and just like bot lane are just the foot soldiers. And yes, what they do is really important, but everyone's just gonna watch like Captain America versus whoever up but the, on the top the side. The foot of the soldiers, map. whichever foot soldier wins, could find the kryptonite and then bring that up. I'm with you. <laughs> yes. Bring that over just to the mixed objective. metaphors. How many, um, how many DC but, and or Marvel fans can we outrage with our just horrible mixed damn metaphors? Damn it, you diverted my brain cell. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, go I, back, come back. back. No, I, had it, I had the line. Sorry, I'll stop speaking. I had the line. Oh, it was, but anyways, that's it just re emphasizes <laughs> yeah. how important I feel like the building of Gumiushi's confidence and T1's bottom lane return to this discussion that you're talking about earlier where beginning of the year, we were all talking about best bottom lane in the world. Mm. You know, Guma, Gumi and Karia, you, you've got this match made in heaven. Uh, and then they had their their summer of uh, disappointment, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll call it. The, the cool thing about this, obviously, is T1 has never played another LPL team other than RNG at Worlds, right? Yeah. They've never, ever played any other LPL. This is the first time they'll play an LPL team that's not RNG at World Championship, which is your brain cells got it back. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> um, so that's that's really interesting. There's a couple of overlaps that I'm curious about. I just talked about the Aatrox like, uh, conundrum. If they can break the Aatrox with the mm. Fioras, that's one option. Silas is another one where Yagao is playing a lot of Silas, yeah. similar to a lot of the LCK mids. Six out of the last seven games. Yeah. yeah, so it's just Faker, all spamming Silas. They so. give Silas over and value like some kind of bot pick and Faker yeah. plays Akali into it, test the waters in game one. Is that going to be a ban in game two? Because in, in best of five, you have to try something. Either you're yeah. leaving Aatrox open, are you leaving Silas open, are you leaving Viego open, right? Another yeah. contested pick between Owner and Kanavi. Are you leaving Graves open? Another contested pick between Owner and Kanavi who did the exact same thing level one to entire, like completely win them their team the first game. So top side has a lot of overlap picks that they need answers for. We talked about Ash Heimendinger, which is a great yeah. like, bot lane, um, but they need to find ways to deal with that, right? Are you going to play, is Kanavi going to play Nidalee into Graves, in, into, into Owner, you know? Are they going to play some Renekton draft if Aatrox, so, like there's, 
I need to see what they leave open, what their answer is, if it breaks it, and that'll yeah. define the series. Especially if bottom lane is getting, uh, whichever team wins the like the, the Omega push wars and vision control, because if you've got Ash Heimerdinger and you have Graves on your team, it's like, how do you play against that as jungle? You've got hawk shots over your head all the time. Graves is invading you relentlessly. It, it, it's it, that it's just think, so frustrating to deal with that. So like, yes, like the Nidalee and and Kindred are like answers to yeah. Graves, but I still think like Graves think is Graves going to be permanent. king, right? Yeah, you, I think you yeah, cannot give that. Graves is going to be king, and I think that just to bring it back to bottling for one second, in a world where we're not playing the orange in the top lane, we're not playing these years in mid lanes. Like Ash and, and bottling meta feels so important to me because, like, I think Ash is going to feel like the pick of the tournament by the end of these like next three best of fives finals otherwise, because it shuts down Callista, it pairs well with I don't Callista. know why anybody hasn't played Jin into it. Is, that's what everyone used to really like playing. I think the problem is like you can play Jin, Varus, MF, it's same thing into Ash, yeah. but you need to find a support champ that can contest the push, which is the yeah. hardest thing. Trimby said that he thought that Nasus with three or four points in E actually one shot timer. <laughs> but it doesn't. But in game it didn't. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't remember which team was who picked out Senior was a Gam or something. I honestly think Zyra um, and Soraka are probably the two most likely. Yeah. Jin is also so oh. free to dive. Core and if J they do Core pick tanks, Jin feels so good. Core JJ was also talking about Bard. Uh, and he mm -hmm. really respects especially Lehen's Bard, which is the other series, but... Um, yeah, it doesn't help you get pushed. Like Syndra W, for example, exactly. is too long cooldown versus Heimer turrets. It's the other strategy, though, you know, where you're Just like... Thing, yeah, because the thing about Bard, and I love Bard because Bard is one of these champions similar to Renata that like functions like a ranged support against melee support. You are the... Bard I love Bard. Bard. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. a big Bard enthusiast. But I think the problem is, is it's just so hard to match the push early on. Level one, you're strong. And maybe if you are there first to wave, you can contest Heimer putting down turrets. You can't contest him once he has the setup, but like Q auto level one on Bard, super strong. Post level six, ulti against immobile champions, ulti against Ash mm -hmm. and Heimer, again, will feel great. But the amount of utility that these Ash Heimer lanes have feels really, really, really difficult to match regardless. Now, I do still think that Bard all is a game-changing ability and against a mobile carries is like a surefire way to win team fights. But getting there, getting oh out of the Oh my God, the team fights hard. in this series are gonna be insane, by yeah. the way. Yeah. Even if one of the teams gets ahead, both of these teams have had massive comebacks. Yeah. I mean, T1 team was fights. a lot of, yeah. T1 was a lot of uh, macro and honestly RNG mistakes. Mm. But both of these teams. And we talk about team fights, but a lot of people might at home were like, what is team fights? All they do is five five. I think there's a lot of like nuance to team fights where the first one is, set up through a lane, right? You either push through bolt if you have no mid push or vision around mid. So you actually yeah. get like an even 5v5 ground. You're a way of uh, threatening flanks. You're a way of holding spells to the point where the enemy team feels pressured. You know, if I'm holding my ornal till the last second while I'm finishing dragon, you have to go in eventually. So you're going to get yeah. by it. So it's a, like- A lot of the times the best way to play frontline is not to actually tank the damage. It's to zone them so they can't do any damage at all. Yeah, so zoning is really, well, Eastern teams are very good at like, yeah. um I think the best example is when, I can't remember the exact series, I think it was DRX EDG, when they took the Renata ult and just used it so they could finish a Drake, right? Yep. They have two very clear ideas of how to team fight. They're either finishing the Drake and they're uh, zoning you away, or they're finishing the Nash and they have a way to like the T1 series where the Camille will zone you yeah. to make sure they're gonna get a guaranteed objective. Or you feel so pressured that you actually force your way in that you just get into such a bad position, you're either in a choke or they can land really easy spells onto you. And they're very, very patient. I think that's the number one thing I've seen from the LPL and LCK teams. Their patience in fights is insane. Like the way they like poke their way through flanks and just take your wards and then you feel sandwiched. And yeah. It's so oppressive, I think. Um, yeah. That's what I see from team fights. I, I think the, 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 the confidence that LPL teams across the board have an executing team fights. That patience that you talked about, the thing that makes it so scary is it's almost lulls. Like when you're watching as a viewer, lulls you into false insecurity. Cause you're like, oh, we're poking, we're trading, we're poking, we're trading. But then like one cooldown get, gets burnt that they're waiting for, or one guy mispositions and instantly it's just bam, dive on that guy, win the fight. And like mm -hmm. the level of communication going on, and I'm not sure if it's spoken or unspoken or if all players are just like on the exact same wavelength, um, but that is like a pleasure to watch. But at the same time, when we talk about T1, I don't feel like T1 were ever in a position where team, like the, the series we saw and a lot of their group stage, the way that they've been drafting and playing mm. has not been about 5v5s. It's been about splitting the map, it's been about skirmishing, it's been about out maneuvering on the map. And I'm really curious what that looks like up against JDG because JDG were team fighting, but part of that was because of how, and a lot of that could have been because of how Rogue wanted to play the game. They were matching a lot of the drafts. They were looking to play around. Orn's on the opposite side, Maokai's on the opposite side. Matching that, are they gonna be 
What is it going to look like when JDG are also playing more scrappy pit top lane picks when there isn't just a go button like an Orn or a Maokai in the game as is as was the case in just about every single game they played against Rogue? I think one of the things is wait, what he was talking about is how they they force you to fight where they want you to mm -hmm. fight ahead of time so that like they don't have to be the ones you know just charging at you yeah. be because they set up so well and get you to come like through these little corridors or whatever well, they get they force you because they make the m map so dark and they press you so much with, with the threat of taking it they make you come through this area and yeah that's and where rng blundered the most in the t1 series i think that they had that control and i once want to ask, answer your question really quickly because you were saying like how the comms work um I don't actually know how any of the LPL teams comes work. I'm sure they talk a little bit in fights, but the way League works, I don't know if you've ever had this yourself, but from my experience as a pro, um, what happens is you know your team's champions limits and what they should do in a fight. So you expect them to do it. So you play accordingly, right? Yep. If I have, you know, if someone's face checking, easy example, someone's face checking Bush, you know your Maokai is going to W him because that guy's griefing. Yeah. Then you think of a wider picture at like the highest level of League in a 5v5, if you see someone misstep, you know your support's just going to flash hook them and you're already ready to react. So it's not even um, about reaction time. It's more like preemptive reaction time. So you're consciously thinking about them doing it. Yeah. And if they don't do it, then you're just staying still. But if they do it, you already thought about it. So you're going to jump on that like instant engage. So, yeah. um, you know, if the dragon's low, you know your jungler's going to go in. So you're already thinking about how you can win the fight if your jungler goes in and dies for the dragon or what your next move is, right? So you're kind of thinking steps ahead based on what you expect your yeah. team champ to do. And I, I think the thing that just makes it so cool to watch as a viewer is that so much of that is is unspoken. Because like when we go back again, and G2's 2019 is an example I pull from a lot because again, this is comms are in a language I can understand, players and scrims that I can watch myself and experience. It's like you expect some like masterful comms as they play the game. Wow, they're making such quick decisions. Clearly they're all communicating ahead of time. So it's just like, oh no, this guy's griefing. We're gonna kill that guy. And it's five players diving on that one yes, guy in an instant split second yeah, communication. Language. You know what I mean? And it's just, it's it's a team of five players. And we do see this at the highest level of worlds consistently who all understand the game at such a high level that even if they're not piloting recon, they know what their recon is gonna do. They know what the enemy champion is gonna do. And that that's always mind blowing to me to watch teams who are that good at that yeah, execution. It's, it's, it's super basic and the same principle applies to even one-on-one -on -one duels. You're always thinking about what is your opponent's best move. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, some of, some of the most iconic, you know, outplays and people are like, oh my God, Faker, insane mechanics on his like Riven versus Cassiopeia. Yep. But every player playing against a Cassiopeia is always thinking about when is this guy gonna try and ult me? So you're always thinking about what is their next move? Like you're saying, what is the next best possible move for them? So that you then preemptively are yep. playing around that. And that's what makes the greatest plays is when people are perfectly able to predict because they know this is your your best out is to play like this and then they play around that my, my favorite moments are when you expect them to do something but they know that you expect them to do something yeah, exactly. right? <laughs> you, this sounds very complicated but a very easy example is if i'm playing gragas and i run up to you and you're low hp and i e yeah you're you think you're gonna you think yeah exactly you I think the flash because yeah. i know you're gonna flash yeah. that's one of those moments where you're one step ahead and there's a couple of moments in that league of legends where it's, it's like, like going up to someone and, oh you yeah. flinch yeah it, this, <laughs> ah, ha, ha, made you flinch some moments like that are, are like mind games in league another good example is like owner invades your top side level one and takes your red now he's run through mid yeah. Push your mid laner out and gone to his red buff. Is he on his red buff or do you just go back towards his blue and is he clearing down? I mean, now do you go to his blue or do you go to his red? It's a game of chicken, you know? You have to like expect what he's expected to do and try to one up it, you know? It's very easy for you to think, oh, he's gone to his red through mid, yeah. I'll go to his blue buff. But actually, he's backtracking because he knows yeah. he wants to go to Jungle right? has this is, this is, I don't want to get too deep into this, but this is the way like pro thoughts go. Yeah. And when but it I mean, comes this to is, fight, you this zoom is, out, this is the anyone, anyone, yeah, sorry. That's also why he did the gank back up the top side because you're like, ah, he's not going to expect me to regank here because he knows I don't have these camps up. Uh -huh. So he knows it's an inefficient play for me to be on this side of the map. And then you go for the inefficient play. That's how you get some of this these. Is, this is how it goes, right? If I take your red raptors, <laughs> no, it's last example. If I take no, it's good. I'm just saying, yeah. you guys are just I, going down the jungle absolute, brain cell just yeah, got yeah. overactivated. Yeah, yeah, this is fine, maybe fine. junglers can relate to this. If you're on red side and they take your red raptors, go through mid, right? The Graves yeah. did this twice already and goes to his red. Your best option actually is to do three camps and gank top because he's clearing his bot camps, right? So the enemy jungler, if he's a pro like Kanavi, will then go uh, skip his red and go it, to his top side because he knows you're going to do it. Again, so this is the beauty of League. Like, it's yeah, so yeah, fun yeah, to watch. Just it's so a, hard to describe. Just because like, <laughs> this occurs, I think, at every level of play. It's just that players in gold don't know all of the information. They don't know. And so this, this whole thing occurs at every level. It's just what makes it beautiful is when um, you're executing at the highest level and it's it's the same thing as poker. You see this in poker. You see this in competitive card games all the time, playing with hidden information. Does he know what I know? Does yeah, who I know what he knows? Yeah. And you're always trying to be one level ahead. 
And what's insane is we see this every single game, right? at high level. And yet, despite that, some players are consistently coming out on top in this mind game where at the end of the day, a certain portion of it is going to be about predicting your opponent's behavior, about guessing where they're going to go. And so, despite the fact that Canyon always looks like a god, he's taking... He is a god. No, 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 I know. But you're like, everything Canyon does is successful. But then when you think about the thought process behind it and the risk behind it, he's taking a risk every time, yet sometimes it feels like this man is flipping heads way more it's, than the rest of us and that's what makes it so freaking cool it's probability it's yeah. really just probability it's it's like a guessing game of like he should be here therefore i will do this and if he is here to answer then it's bad for him because he yeah. should have been there so i'll back off and even canyon has bad splits right the, yeah. but the regular season wasn't wasn't great for no, canyon sure. yeah he had a he had a pretty weak regular season actually yeah. i think what happened to damon in the regular season was um Canyon would look for plays that weren't there like he would overforce things or yeah. he would just kind of farm and do nothing uh, and the overforce will either backfire or the... We got, all right, brain cell, brain cell. <laughs> bringing the brain cell back. Okay, okay. We have a series, JDG versus T1. Now, I understand. This was our transition. So we, I we understand. Predict it? So predict we, it. Oh, okay. We have, we have to prediction? lock it in. We said we talked about it. Top lane. I had, I had the a dream. They're the superheroes. we got the foot soldiers in the bot lane. Uh, I'm predicting... I, I think it's going to be 3-1 to T1. I dreamt after the T1 series versus RNG that Faker was lifting the championship. So, I'm for sure predicting Didn't T1. Cap, Cap Even though... Once, and he picked a champ on stage because he dreamt about it the last yeah. time in the finals or something. And they won. <laughs> and they won. <laughs> um, We're both unhinged. Okay, I'm sorry. 3-1 to T1. Yeah. So I, I actually think it's good. I think it's for sh- it's really close. Um, yeah. That doesn't mean you have to predict three two. I, I, I mean, a close series can still be a three zero. Yeah, I, I think I am predicting three two though, um, as well as like I would not be surprised if JDG won, but I would be disappointed because <laughs> honestly, I it's just such a great story to have you know the return of faker with these four young zoomers behind him mm. you know trying trying to make the return and and win another faker a, versus gen g in another north american finals i mean or even the, yeah. the greatest DRX. narrative would be drx the death's last dance making it all the way to fight faker, faker the god of league of legends uh you know at the very top in the finals anyways that, that's pretty far down the rabbit hole but i do want to do jdg justice and i also like their story because even though they're lpl number one seed they don't have a lot of fans nope. and a lot of fans actually dislike the org because of the previous years yep. of like you know failing in the riff rivals versus korea they're very strong regional rivalry if yep. you mess that up then the fans get super pissed and you know their their coach has inflamed fans at yep. times as well so and um, a lot of the western fans don't really know the the jg yeah players and they don't have the, they don't have those big stars that yeah. really bring like a lot 369 of fans here. is the most notable player because it's Kanabi, he's yeah. easy to attach and his story Kanabi. is a comeback story everyone flamed his ass because <laughs> for losing Losing last time so much, yeah. and now everyone's like, it was "Wow!" A liability on top esports, right? exactly. And, and so here's 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 a question: Since you guys are both leaning towards T one, uh, if is the winner of this best of five in the top lane the best top laner in the world? Yes. Yeah, I guess it's the only real evidence we can use, right? So I would just say, yeah. That's right. That's all I wanted to hear. Um, You're supposed to say yes. But the, <laughs> yes is the answer. Yeah, I was yes like is the answer. Yes is the answer. <laughs> the, the logic I'm going with for T131 is I think JDG will probably win either game one or two, depending on side selection on blue side. Mm. Um, and I think T1 will win the, the best 5-3-1 because I think they're more flexible. I see Faker and Owner as a more flexible mid-jungle than Kanavi and Yigao. Does that mean they're better? No. I just think the longer a series goes on, T1 players have shown more. Like Zeus can play things like Yoni and GP if needed. His his top lane champ pool is very deep. 369 leans towards like mm-hmm. Aatrox, uh, Nar, Rennington a little bit. Has the Gwen as well. And I also think bot lane has a bit more flexibility. Like we've seen Kalista, we've seen Oh, Paris, for, we've I, seen I, Yeah, I think Ash the bottom lane is for sure. So I'm just basing this on what I've seen champ pool wise. I think strength wise and skill wise, they're very, very evenly matched, especially across all lanes. Maybe if JDG had one advantage, it would be jungle. Um, so I'm going to keep my eyes on see if Kanavi can out jungle owner, right? And just get individual leads on carry junglers. But overall, I think I favor T1 in this, in this matchup. As far as bottom lane flexibility, uh, Guma and Karia, each of them played eight unique champions in nine games. They, they, they can barely get more flexible. Like they're actually just going full rando. Yeah, I, um, I mean, obviously not random with a purpose here. No, 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 sure. Yeah. Um, as far as the owner thing, there have been a couple games, I can't even remember which one now from group stage, where it did look like owner did not have a plan laid out for the game and he ends up in a spot where he's just farming his own camps on the wrong side of the map 
of where the opponents are trying to make their next play. So I feel like that would be the one caveat if if owner is not is not basically ready. Is d- does not have think, his plan laid out for where he's supposed to be. I think the other caveat that I will give um is What's your that prediction? I, I this is actually really hard. So let me give my caveats and then I'll give my prediction. And I feel like I have to balance us cuz I don't think this is as T1 favored as two people predicting T1 would indicate even if you're talking about his very close mm-hmm. series. So I will say 3-2 uh, for JDG, I, I think that the thing about the Rogue series is that it doesn't give you any new data, realistically. Like, what did we really learn from the Rogue series about JDG? I would say very little. Whereas the T1 series showed us so much in terms of pick diversity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it is easier right now to predict T1 with confidence because we've seen so much more from them. Because, But that does not mean inherently that there is not more waiting from us from the side of JDG. Now, I think Kanavi would be my preferred jungler in this matchup. I think that owner, when you look historically, has been a bit feast or famine. I think that has not been the case this tournament. I think it was the case last year when we look at like coming into like the DK series, et cetera. Um, and while the bot lane meta is super important, I don't want to just say that like this is something that Hope and Missing aren't going to be ready to bust out after another week of scrims or a week of practice. Mm. I think T1 are the easier, the easier prediction. But I, I do think that this is super, super close. And I think that ultimately when you talk about JDG, you're looking a lot, you you have to be ready for them to show us a lot that we have not seen yet. Because again, the Rogue series was such a wampa stomp yeah. that I don't think that that's like good wampa data. Stomp. No, yeah, like yeah, like RNG T1, good data, good information. We learned a lot about the team that fell valid outside of maybe game three. JDG, I don't feel like we've seen pushed to the limit whatsoever. And I feel like we didn't even get into their draft prep in that game. I mean, it would be my assumption. And maybe that's all they've got, and that would be a problem, and it would make it easy to pick T1. But that's like, there's this cloud of doubt around this team for me, just because there's Wait. there's uncertainty because I don't know. Yeah, JDG, now that I think about it, never really were pushed. It's hard to like um, gauge whether that was just rogue. But you can't use that weak. to predict, exactly. right? That's the struggle. It's because it's just like, we have a thing that we've seen that we know is mm. tangible, and that's what? what T1 has showed us. And what JDG hasn't shown us is a question mark. Like, that's we can't use that as evidence to predict. I'm just giving them the, yeah, the yeah, benefit yeah. of the doubt in this case. What I, what I will say is, actually, I think I was wrong a couple minutes ago. Now I think about 369, he does play things like GP, Kennen, Sejuani, uh, Renekton. Like, no, nah, he can play a lot of champs. So I think top jungle is where JDG can find their biggest advantage. And I think what we've seen from T1 is they focus a lot on top lane as well. So yeah. I wonder if this is just gonna be a top side brawl uh, of things like, you know, Akali, Silas, uh, Aatrox, Fiora, Graves, Viego. These are the like power picks you expect. Um, so I didn't give enough credit to 369. I think top and jungle are most evenly matched, slightly jungle favor for JDG. Um, but. I, I, it's I, it's I think both these teams are so I, I agree fucking good. but I think <laughs> talk rounding out our discussion here and you guys correct me if I'm wrong I still think bot lane meta short of massive skill discrepancies which I don't regardless of what JDG have in the tank expect to really see manifest in the same way they did in the rogue series I think bot lane meta will be truly telling yeah because there is a chance that we see more ash hammering we probably will there's a chance that JDG are just much more equipped to play against it and don't need to show us like crazy revolutionary counter picks because as much fun as it is to be like, oh my God, what's the next step in the evolution? Some players are just like more comfortable in a matchup and aren't going to give it as big of advantages or leads. And there are some things that it's going to do regardless, like Hawkshot, like arrows that are going to be need to be answered. But, you know, when a champion like Aphelios is the best in the meta, he's like the best for a reason, right? When he's S tier and you can still argue that Lucian Ami or Kalista and sometimes like people... I feel like we get caught up in the idea that everyone has to one up eternally to like try to find these niche counter picks, but you can just be better on that pick and execute better. And I'm just, so I'm wondering how much evolution is actually needed. I, th- I think there's one also missing thing we didn't touch on from mid lane champion pool. Cause we touched on Faker, uh, Silas possibly mm-hmm. being a hole. Yeah, Gao in the last 50 games, I'm doing a quick scroll down him, has not played a single Akali game, but Akali is a much, more replaceable piece in this mid lane meta yeah. because he has, um, he's been spamming the Talia for his Azir counter mm-hmm. um, and he's been spamming the Silas. And I think those are, those are two more crucial um, picks in the current meta. But it is interesting that each of them is kind of missing one of these pieces mm-hmm. of the mid-lane triumvirate triangle. of, yeah. of mid lane champions. What I would do to watch scrims the last two weeks from all these teams. Yeah. Oh my God, I wonder what it- Also, like. just because he hasn't played one in like 50 games on stage doesn't mean he can't play it. Exactly, that's yeah, why yeah, it's yeah, always yeah. Like so hard to discuss. I mean, I do I as well. We literally heard from Rogue, Rogue that they were screaming it, like bruiser top lanes and we only ever saw tanks. Like yeah. you never know what scrims to stage is gonna we look like. We only get to see like 
ten percent of this real story, you know, from yep, like just yeah. live game data because the amount of games yeah. these guys play in scrims and stuff. Yeah, but I think I think we have to shift forward. Like ultimately, clearly a very close series. And again, currently it feels like we're as a whole giving the edge to T1. I'll predict JDG, and I'm going to say three two because I think the series will be really close. I hope it's five games. I, if semifinals are always the best match at Worlds, don't get me wrong, I want a good World Finals too. But I would like for that semifinal thing to remain true, where we get a banger best of five. Because remember, this is the it's last. It's gonna be dance. hard after this last couple uh, yeah. quarters that we had. Uh, it's true. It's true. We might have already seen the best series, but uh, we'll see if the last seed of the LPL can make good or shut down the faker narratives and the Genji faker Damon, hype. Though. Genji Damwon is the banger. Let's talk about first. Yeah, let's talk about Genji Damwon. At least Genji versus oh, DRX. Oh yeah, we gotta go all the way back to quarters now, huh? Canyon was. <laughs> Now you guys can talk about Canyon. Now you know you what? absolute degenerate fanboys. Now you can just go. Just talk about Canyon. Dude, we'll just do 30 minutes on Canyon. Anyone who doesn't care about Canyon why, can go to the bathroom, can take a break. This series is why I'm such a damn one fanboy. They never fail to deliver in best of series. They're just so creative. Every time you watch it, you feel like the game's being pushed to the absolute limits. Even if they lose the series or they're losing the games, they do the wackiest stuff ever. And yeah. I'm going to say it. I think Damon should have won that series. As much as I'm a Damon fanboy, uh, killing out my bias, they made so many mistakes. Game one, they dove a bot tier two and gave Chovy a triple kill, which was a bit of a blunder when they had a decent sizable lead with their comp. Game two, they threw at Nash for no reason when Sejuani uh, gets in the pit and Nemesis gets it. I hate, uh, hate should have. I, I hate should have as well. I, I will say could have won that had many opportunities yes, to close out that series. I like that, could have. Damon yeah, had, yeah, yeah. had many opportunities to close out this series to the point where it could have been a 3-1, yeah. right? Similar to the DRX one, not as extreme with the next explosion, whatever. Uh, but um, <laughs> they had leads, which I think they should have executed upon and actually closed the game out. Yeah. Um, so so I'm kind of disappointed in that one in that sense in the first two games. I think I expected more from them. The bounce back was great. Canyon and Showmaker almost put the entire team on their back to actually carry them through. Um, and I want to give a small shout out to Nugri because I think he played pretty damn well. Um, yeah. He was playing a lot of Rennington, a lot of Psycho builds, a lot of Lucidity Boots, Proudus Globe, Blade. God knows what Cyril does, but he was a pressure point to help Canyon invade a lot. And I think that Dam one should have gone to Aphelios way earlier on this series. I don't know why they were pissing around giving over Yumi play. I, just, I stand by. I've Dr. been waiting to start yelling about this because yeah. you're talking about, oh yeah, they, they were so close in this series. They should have won this series. Yeah, maybe don't give over goddamn Yumi, Yumi two Lahens. games in a row to the one of the best Yumi It's the actually world. insanity. Yeah. Coming, one of my biggest points setting up this quarterfinals, I was like, well, Yumi has to be permabanned by Damwon because you can't give it to Lehens and the Lehens also has the pocket counter also pick take also, with the right, Zens. Okay. Can we just talk one second? Lucian Nami is fake ass news, boy. Like this this champion won one game in the end and it had very little, any AD carry would have won the game. Yeah. Like Lucian Nami looked awful yeah. on both sides of this <gasps> matchup and there was so much prio on it. Sorry. Also, so it's, 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 let it out, Kobe. You got the one brain cell, let it fire, baby. But it let wasn't it go. one game they gave over Yumi. It was two <laughs> games they gave over Yumi. MF Yumi against Lushinami, and they thought it was working. And also they put, and they, they no, put no. Nuguri on Gragas, which is a tank, which is a top lane nullifier. When he's on things like Sejuani, that can actually uh, threaten kills or have stronger 2v2s, or, or things like Renekton, where he can pressure, the game looks so much different. So, I'm, there goes my damn one fanboy. I was so out. mad for Canyon. I was just so You're mad. mad Canyon? Bro, Doctim is literally... And I stand by this, the best Aphelios player in the world. There are better 80 carries. He is the best Aphelios in the world. And I had to watch two games of his mid-ass Lucian. Like, he's a fine Lucian, whatever. But he's a pro player. But, like, he could have just picked this the champion that he's the best at. Yeah. That it, gives more to the I composition. Mean, and they weren't like they were doing well in lane. Yeah. Oh I God, said God. this on the analyst desk, but I was like, he literally has over 20 more games on, on Aphelios than any other champion. And it's his highest win rate. That does not have, that, that is like almost being like a one trick. He has 71 something percent win rate on Aphelios mm. as his most played the, champion. The funniest thing is that in the one to three Damon banned Azir, game one and game two to give over Yumi. And then when they left open Azir and banned the Yumi, the Azir wasn't that big of an issue for them to deal with. Exactly. With things like the Swain. So I think they're probably kicking themselves looking back in hindsight, like why the hell do we not just leave Azir open? It wasn't that big of an issue for exactly. us. Exactly, um, yeah. Because it doesn't spike as early, and when they were drafting things like you know <sighs> Kane and, and stuff, when they're invading the, I don't know what Jungus was, was it Maokai or Poppy or something? They were Maokai, invading all the time. And then game two was uh, yeah. Sejuani. Um, yeah, I'm just overall, I'm so excited I got to watch that series. I think that was one of the best series in world's yeah. history. It was so. It came down to a top lane team fight where Genji were cornered and somehow won. There's so many intricacies yeah. of that to, fight I, where if Nuguri didn't run away or if Dokdam didn't flash forward yeah. early, to be they fair, could have turned it. I think that. There's obviously the smite thing. So for those who missed it, um, Canyon accidentally smites the wrong target. Yep. Which is, but that aside, I mean, credit to 
that's just a situation where I feel like Sejuani's fat ass right next to Baron. Not was it, yeah, was Sejuani smite? Thick. Wait, I don't, I don't yeah, know. I think it was Sejuani. I think it was Naro Sejuani. I, remember, yeah. I think it was this, I think it was Sejuani. I remember it was right next to Baron. I, I just felt for them because it felt like they, they crawled out of this massive hole. And immediately they put themselves in that hole. Credit to Peanut for making sure the Kane never got transformation, just conceding camps so he didn't transform. Kane looked absolutely useless this game outside of one really good W. Um, but the second they had to fight into the victor, the second they were running face first into the victor, like you knew the odds were as bad as they were going to be because they had to take the fight and the fight was not on their terms. Mm. Running into the victor was always gonna feel bad. Chovy, again, like Ruler gets a lot of credit for the quadrant at the end, he played it well, but like Chovy, Zanya Zing, the Inferno Malt, the, the Blue Ophelia assault was massive. I think they lose that fight if he doesn't Zanya it. Also his alts, his E's, so but every, full combo Cho that. Chovy, hard carried that fight. Ruler cleaned it. Ruler made sure that they could finish it. But like the way Chovy played that is like, that was That's it. why I correctly predicted 3-2 Gen yeah. G. <laughs> that was the most why, reliable yeah. carries in the world. Oh and my so gosh. I'll give you some stats right now because Gen G are 50 wins, nine losses from the start of summer to right now, yeah. including quarterfinals. Two of those losses were in the quarterfinals. So they came into that best of five series with 50 wins and seven losses. Most total, of their losses the have been to Dom one and then in they the regular lost, season yeah. two. And two of them were yeah. two of them were in best of threes in the regular yeah. season to Dom Exactly, one. that's the whole point. They lost one game against RNG that puts them at six losses. Yeah. You count out their losses to Dom one, they came into the series with four losses yeah. total from the beginning of summer in best of three series, double round robin. Yeah. That to me is absurd. They had one of the best regular season win rate records. They 3-0'd the finals. They, were, they are such a dominant team. And I think a lot of people struggle to put their finger as to why they're so dominant. I think the biggest factor I see is their mid and bot are just the highest caliber of players at never falling behind and making sure they're either even Most or ahead reliable. in every matchup. 100%. They're so consistent, it's baffling. Like there's never any, egregious mistakes. You think of like 2020 Showmaker and Canyon where mid jungle is always even or one. That's a similar principle, but applied to mid and bot. Top and jungle can be inconsistent. Peanut's playing really well. Doran is the weak factor, I suppose, if you had to find like a chink in the armor, but their mid and bot, it sounds hard to like digest, but they will never make a mistake in lane and they'll either be even or punishing you and getting ahead. And this is so powerful in, in best of series, especially. Yeah, did you see? Um, Cause I'm just thinking of how calm Chovy always is. The player cams after the game winning team fight, everybody on the team, the player cams are like, oh yeah, yeah, we did it, go run to Nexus. And Toby's like, good job. And then takes a sip of his water and just is like staring into the camera. Emotion. He's, he's still, he's still, it's just so calm. I feel like he probably like, I'm one day I wonder if we get like a Chovy documentary or like an inside on Chovy interview. And if like, if he just like is replaying the game in his head already, like, oh man, I mean, I missed that CS, I missed that CS. Like this is terrible. I was, I was like, memeing <laughs> that he he's just sad that since he died first in the team fight, he can't be CSing right now. No, I, I, I was thinking the same thing, but I was like, like great, we he won. missed a cannon at 1250. Yeah, and he's still oh, upset. He's like, God damn it. God damn it. It's like <laughs> Scotty writes on a notepad. Yeah, it's like, I could, I could have lived if I had a little bit more money and a little bit more. Yeah. Oh. And uh, thinking back to the LCK finals as well, uh, the Gen GT1 series when they 3 0 it's a very similar situation where like mid and bot are just always even or ahead and they're first to objectives and they're set up first and they're ready to yeah. fight. And Zeus didn't do anything in that series and you can't blame him. They never banned top laners. They banned Camille like once or twice on 4-5. There was never any like hard focus, shut down Zeus, ban him out. And there was never really either any jungle attention top to like, let's shut down Zeus. He just picked like bad champs into Aatrox like Nar and Orn and he was more of a supportive player and he didn't play counter picks to the, to the level that T1 are playing it now. Yeah. So the game was just a 4v4. So T1 strong point was never really in the map and their meta read was really poor. So Gen G just executed the 4v4 and they just won and they were just better at it. Um, so that's just the story of their 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 summer really. Like well, their 4v4 is just so good and Doran can facilitate. He's very flexible Doran. Um, he does get a lot of flack I feel like from the community in terms of like Imagine if Genji had Zeus, how good would they be, you know? Yeah. Um, but he does his job well. Like he he he's a rock as well. He can he does have a couple of blunders here and there where he may lose his lane or he needs Peanut to bail him out. But you can't have five superstars in every role. Like if you look at the world's winners over the last few years, you can never have five players who are playing to the absolute hundred and ten percent immaculate play. Um, so I, I I can't really fault him too much. I think he's still playing well. Yeah, I and I think the big thing is is looking forward in the tournament. You know, Someone seeing how to suffer. See, yeah, sure, most certainly. And I and I just think to go back to what you said about the carry duo and what you've said about the carry duo, most consistent. Like this is the team that is the easiest predict in any best of five ever. Like you can like 
it doesn't matter. I don't care what your reasoning is. You tell me Genji, I'm like, you've probably got a good reason. Like it's probably easy. And it's it really is just bot lane eighty carry support. And like regardless of of jungle, and I love actually love Pino's player, he's one of my favorite players to watch because he is so creative. Like if you if you had to bet, if if I had to have three people follow me into battle, it would be Lehen's ruler and Chovy. Like these are the guys who have got your back no matter what. Like you're not betting on anybody else. Also, I'm betting on Peanut to jungle diff at any other jungler left in the tournament. I think he's gone against Canyon. Can, you know? can, I'm just gonna say Canyon is the only jungler that ever makes Peanut look like this. Yeah. So Pe Peanut will jungle this diff year especially. this year, especially with the freaking the spring. It was the spring semifinals Nidalee where Canyon, fun, yeah. yeah, Canyon <laughs> nearly invaded his ass both sides. And, that was and the beginning of it. That, that was, he was building his mental toughness, I mean, against it. And you could see it this time when he was getting invaded by the cane. Uh, anyways, we don't need to go delve into the, that. The bottom. Sometimes, especially for jungle, it is such a mental matchup always, th th this role. That, like, you can talk about turning nameplates off all you want or whatever, but jungle, you actually need nameplates on because you're trying to read the psychology of your opponent always. And there, to me, there's no other jungler in this tournament that's going to jungle Diff Peanut. I think, especially in their matchup coming up versus Pioshik, I think Peanut is going to yeah, is gonna jungle I, I think so too. The, the, the last thing I'll say about that is like, if you've ever jungled and you've cleared out your bot camps, you're listening to like a jamming song, you know, you're, you're mm -hmm. bopping out, you're looking mm -hmm. at the lanes, you walk to your wolves, they're gone. You go to yeah. your blue, they're gone. Your grump, it's gone. And then you're just sitting like that heart sinking feeling of like, oh shit, my whole top side. You gone. Imagine experiencing that like four times in a competitive game, you know, at the fourth time you're like, not again. How did, how did he get here? I was covering every entrance this time. How was he doing it? And especially like the higher you climb, once you get high or low, you'll play the same people over, over and over because the pool is, is pretty small. And you remember these names. You remember this MF er who counter jungled you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you you right, write that MF down. jungle, yeah, that's I a, hear that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's a blood note, okay? Yeah. You know, it's, it's this kindred player that's red buff Q over the wall and come invade you every single time yep. trying to Jeez. steal your grump and shit like that. Actually, I remember you when you were playing Champions Q what was the player? It was Keel. Keel cheesed you like two times and I could see the rage strange, steaming out of your ears and you're like just flipping out. That was Every so jungle cringe. has been there. Everybody knows that. You keep a list, you know, when when you're- The jungle, the jungle cheese list is like- Exactly, yeah. you keep oh, a list. What? Like, oh, next time I'm gonna- It was really smart though. As much as it's like cheese, the way he got to those wolves especially, it's just crazy. You know, you late invade one side, you ward level one the next well, game. And then you come over the dragon pit. Okay, let's stack five men. And then you come through head. blue buff wolves. He's like, in his head so how hard. How many angles and, does he find? And did you, this, the one where it was so sad, seeing him like just kind of die inside, peanut die inside, when he came back, like you knew off the, after the counter invade, his raptors and red are gone on second spawn. His second spawn's gone already. And you see him coming back and checking and you're just like, not again. Uh, and then he's like standing there watching him counter jungle his Krugs. And yep. he's like, he's actually calm because he's not letting the cane touch him. It's very important not to let yep. cane touch you and get the soul transformation things. That's why he had such a late cane transformation. Mm. But he, and he's trying to like minimize the damage fighting over these I mean, it was a, it was a spectator jungle role. Like he just came, he just showed up to watch Canyon jungle. That's what this game felt like. Like that last game was and yet, brutal. Mental toughness, and you're playing a tank. You're playing Sejuani. You're playing engaged for your team. You just have it's, to be the front line. That's why you, you have just, to. Someone's got to tank it. I yeah, you. someone's you just got to suck it up. You're like, it's like somebody has to guard Kobe. Somebody has to guard LeBron. You know. All right, they're they're gonna dunk on you, right? They're gonna be the best in the world. They're gonna shoot threes and swish in your face. Somebody's got to tank that shit. Yeah, but I think we can. I can say I'm pretty sure Canyon is the best jungler in the world, and this is we're not going to see another matchup and like this. And most entertaining to watch. And most entertaining. That's what Canyon. There's, Canyon. Not, there's Canyon. not going to be another Kane. No one else in this tournament will play Kane. I'm pretty confident of that. I think Canyon is the only one with the skill and probably maybe the Kanavi. The prep. I mean, the thing is, is like, I just think maybe maybe Kanavi. Like, I would love to see it personally because I think it is such a thrilling champion to watch because there is this pressure on him at all times to kind of get shit done. But People also forget he did this in the in the semis as well. He was playing Talon yeah. Jungle, you know, when he was stealing the Eldragon. Yeah. dragon as much as it was like kind of meta, it kind of wasn't as well. So this guy was just busting out like the coolest champs Again, ever to he watch. He can play He's anything so because he freaking can get to rank one mid lane off roll and stuff. Like, he got rank one and rank two in Korea before he came to, right. uh, yes. to, to NA. I'm gonna tell you right now that 
I'm down to start a second podcast called <laughs> the Canyon Fanboy Club. And we just go over every single game. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. but now I'm gonna we're gonna ban Canyon Talk for the rest of the podcast because we've segued into Canyon Talk. So let's make our LCK All Star team since there's three LCK teams nope. left in the tournament. No, nope. uh, nope. Canyon still on my All Star team. No, nope. Doug Lennon. Nope. <laughs> nope. Okay. Uh-uh. Anyways, the other. The so other Genji, side let's of this, talk yeah. about the other side of the series. Obviously, EDG versus DRX. This is again absolute mind-blowing banger oh of a series so many thrilling moments the death story incredible this i thought for sure was an edg win i didn't think there was any way but so you know deft was actually calling in comms too the inhib is respawning soon as he's hitting the nexus so this wasn't a surprise this was a clench and pray to god that you can finish the nexus oh, as it respawns man. he was call. he was shot calling uh, uh you know it's gonna respawn soon boom boom he's so close if they had gotten any little bit yeah i can't imagine the mental bounce back from that you are like 30 damage from ending the game then you lose like a couple minutes later and you're backstage just with your hands in your head like insane is the like is the world against me you know he's been to quarterfinals like six seven times in a row always losing and now he's like got a chance to actually win a game for once to actually make it even. You must the, feel like the whole world. This team has God mental now. That, that, that's coming back in reverse sweeping. They did a reverse sweep, wait, wait, wait. four one victory in a best of five. Yeah. There's God mental coming in yeah. for DRX. So even though Gen G this whole year, you would for sure give them you know big priority in this matchup. DRX has the power of narrative. Steel trap mental, just invulnerable mental now. Yeah. And and Zeka, perfect champion pool for this meta. Yeah. He he is the god of this mid lane meta with, he, with his Silas and, and Akali mastery. But the last thing I'll say on mental to further make this clear that this is ironclad, they picked Kindred game three. They picked Draven game three. Yeah, I was. Piyoshik means the kindred mark. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's his pick, but yeah, like, yeah. still, this is this but is, can be had no wins on Draven coming into. This yeah, series. this is like Giga Chad right there. Like to go, you're like, all right, elimination game. I'm pulling out my pocket pick. Like we Mark. saw what happened in early game with Zeus's pocket pick. He got blast. Now he came back and made good. It's not even Def's pocket pick. He's zero two. In not Def. Career. No, I'm talking about Kindred. Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, he got the, the the Draven ult to get the cash in while he's yeah. getting ganked. Yeah. yeah, that's like it's game. Not, that's like that game, is the that is that that's is a game the mental moment. Like, was is is that even the right game? Is our brain so? Yeah, it is. It yeah, is. No, no, yeah, 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 yeah. That's because, right. Because he got the cash in right as he died, so he gets <laughs> he gets all of the cash in gold rather than getting cut in half. And like, it's like it matters. That, that is insane to do that. Like after this series where you're trying to reverse sweep, you're down. You just had this inhibitor die in front of you. You're getting ganked, and you're like, oh no, it's doomed. Uh, it, that could have been and, the crumple moment. And remember, that could have been this series is over for them. Well, but he's like, no, boom, and he gets. It's like bazillion gold. Yeah, but then remember it was still close. It's like EDG pushing down mid lane and they force scout to Zanyas and then immediately Soraka silence and they just monster that fight. And I need to make an anime off of that series. I've never seen death. a more emotional series in my life. Like yeah. that was the biggest brother versus brother make of I think the Genji like, storyline emotion. The Genji Dom one one was a, a little skill. bit a better of a game. Oh, yeah, yeah, but absolutely. this one, oh my god, so this much. This was like full of heartbreak. I was, cr- I actually was crying too at the end when Deft and Pioshik started crying in the interview. How, like, it's, I, I don't there's know. There's no shame in those tears, It's, it's like, it's, it's I from, ball for it. you know, he, he, he started from, well, didn't start from, but like losing game two, being at like the lowest of lows to mm-hmm. then yeah. hitting the highest of highs, like three games later, to then just like having an emotional breakdown because it all hits him on the stage. Never right? getting past, quarterfinals for, 2014 years, was his last eight semifinals? Eight yeah. Years. Like the second that Shox asked that question, it's like it's been eight years. Yeah. You know, he just it just all hits him. I think at once, like the emotion of the entire series. Yeah. Um, so I think DRX now has got like a place in everyone's heart. Mm-hmm. I think DRX to everyone is now and Deft yeah. especially. Everyone has you w- a and bit of Deft. Yeah, in them, yeah, and yeah. everyone wants to see them succeed. Yeah. So DRX. It- the only analysis I've got for you now is they've got the plot armor, baby. <laughs> but they this also is the miracle run. Yeah, a- uh, plot armor plus. The champion pools and the versatility are are so in their favor. Their mid lane yep. champion pool for Zeka, obviously. Silas is permabend. I can tell you that. Silas yep. and Akali are he, he's actually the best at both sides of that matchup, so it gives them a little bit of an edge. And Azir, his Azir is not bad. No. Nope. So he 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 can do that as well. And then the bottom lane. Freaking Barrel was the one who started the Heimerdinger train. Barrel, they were the ones with the with with the with Barrel the first iteration. The Bar- so it wasn't yeah. talked about as much. He, yeah. Like. 
Well, he lost the finals last Even year. though he's like inting Heimerdinger, running around crazy, doing awesome weird stuff and getting picked off a lot yeah. of times, he's also putting so much pressure, making so many plays for them. He, he lost the finals last year, right? He yeah. lost the five game series to EDG and his team got knocked out the day before he played. That one was gone. Now he's left them, joined DRX, a team that struggled through the regular season, never really pushed their way into He got the revenge. And then he got revenge. He took out EDG for that one and he is carrying the damn one hopes, right? Um, and now he's- They were all to watching too in the crowd. Yeah, they're all there oh watching, supporting God. him, which was just really nice to see a couple of T1 players yeah, I know, it's well. a tear. It's like emotion it's a across the board. It's a moment to see all the, them supporting. I mean, they're probably supporting all of DRX, right? But especially Barrel for players like yeah. Phil Baker and Canyon and such. And like, he is, he's playing his own meta at this world. He's doing what he wants, when he wants. He's not playing any champion skew. He's, we had on Suicide no Loki account, I believe, as far as I'm aware from tracking the pros. But he is like in the shadows, helping DRX and carrying DRX and pushing Deft to like the semi-finals with his team. And he's like underrated. I think the storyline of him taking down EDG for that one, it's just, it's just- Did you hear this sto- uh, his, his interview answer to you about the Heimerdinger? He was like, well, they banned it against us. So I assumed it must be strong. Then I started playing it. And he's just like, boom. And now he's, he's just running, oh. running the whole show because someone banned it against them with, without them you know, investing on it just because Heimerdinger had been taking yep. over in scrims yeah. and champions queue. And then he just picks it up. And I, and I think you already highlighted some of the things that make him, but I, I, he's probably the best Heimerdinger that we've seen play. I mean, I love the way he's setting up picks over the wall yeah. around mid lane, playing from fog. He's looking for the weird angles. Looking for the weird angles, roaming mid, stopping backs in game one, um, throwing picks out over the wall. And yeah, he got, he got bullied in game two to be sure. And I think that is something that we have to look at as we go further because uh, people are going to try to like if he tries to roam and get out of lane as much as a Heimerdinger, like you're gonna get, you're gonna get jumped on, you're gonna get bopped. So this is the thing, um, and I do really hope and and actually expect the bottom lane champion pool mm-hmm. to like proliferate off of this yeah. new meta of the pushing, you know, fight over double poke power for bottom lane. Um, the ones that can avoid those deaths walking around because any of the answers are also very vulnerable. If you're playing Zyra support, guess what? Vision becomes really hard for you to get for your team. Mm-hmm. You are squishy as hell. Mm-hmm. Mid laners, especially the mid laners in this freaking tournament that are walking around are going to one shot you. Guess what? If the enemy team has an Akali and they're post level six, you're like a level four yeah, Zyra or something. Three you're all actually over again, food. Baby. You're a- they yeah. actually will just two shot you. Alternator spike, so, boom. So if you have Heimerdinger's, Zyra's, all these like poke heavy, aggressive bottom lane supports that don't have escapes running around, some of the difference could become the ones that die the, le- the least and still manage to work like with their junglers to get yeah, the vision. That, that's the beauty of Beryl especially because he's just so good at, he's playing all these range supports and he's like getting, he's the one player you look at and he's like, he's the one in the bot lane getting leads or like getting the push and mm-hmm. meriting like a lead to help his team. Um, if you look at the LCK this year, the best two supports are Carrier Lehens. A lot of people overlook Beryl. He is yeah. the third best support in the league. I'm sure of it. But DRX never finished, I believe, in the top three, top four. They're always like fifth and sixth in the regular seasons. You think of like players like Kale and DRX Life. Literally- Beryl was always <laughs> third place minimum. And even when other supports were slumping, maybe he could push himself to second. I need more Beryl in my life. That's okay. what I'm saying. All right. All right. All I'll say is that like, it's rough though for DRX. I think their like heroic rise has been awesome to watch, but this is a team we didn't even get a chance to play a best of five against Gen.G. You know, they get knocked out round one. Of, all their, they get knocked yeah. out round one of playoffs every time. They lost all their regular year. season best yeah. threes versus Gen.G. They I also, I would for sure lost, they the, lost the most year. recent one as yeah. well. Uh, it was a 2-0 most recently. Yeah. And I think that this is definitely going to be hard. I think that again, more strengths that we saw in this matchup, and I'm not sure how they'll manifest against Gen.G, but the Ezreal from Deft was great. I love when teams can play around in Ezreal well because usually my experience LC, LEC is when we see Ezreals they just sit there they're just safe they do very little they're very underwhelming not only did they really capitalize on on the Ezreal pick as a whole and leverage the pick to its fullest as you'd expect from a long time Ezreal player like Def but the entire team was ready to leverage a two item spike was ready to fight around that point I cannot count the amount of times I can still think back to a Han Sama game right before he left where he was like two item Ezreal and re- people were just not forcing fights they weren't doing anything with it he was just farming he had two items, he's just farming, chilling on the side lane, doing fuck all. And I hate that. Deft is not one of those players, and DRX are not one of those teams. And that, like, that's something they deserve credit for because there's not a lot of people at this tournament who would pick Ezreal. I still don't think it is the greatest pick, but I like that they have that as a backup in a world where maybe bot lane becomes a problem where they need to take a step back and they want to focus on something else, someone like Zekka, um, that they have these avenues, that they have these angles. 
Yeah, Even like in the games they were losing, um, shout out to Kingan as well. Kingan is a player that I, I didn't have high expectations of. Game one, he had a lot of good moments and he had some grief moments in this series too. Mm -hmm. But like game four, game three, uh, game four or game three, I can't remember, the Camille game, um, really, really popping off. And like, it was a team-wide effort to bring this bring this to fruition. That said, like, you never know. Pioshek still feels like a guy where sometimes we're flipping a coin on what version of Pioshek we're gonna get against Peanut. It's I got money. Believe. I got money. I would make a side bet on peanut jungle diffing, and uh, I think that's the safe. That's the, the you got having a big yeah. big rebound. You got better that. odds on that side. He got he got past his demon. Okay, he got past Canyon. Yep. So I think Genji have lost. Uh, DRX have lost every single series because it's Genji this year, yeah. and I don't think they've won a single most, game. <laughs> most teams. Did. Most to be fair, most, most teams, teams did. We just Gen came into this Genji, talking about how they're like literally Genji like all their losses ran like, the LCK. Yeah, Genji yeah. ran the LCK, but uh, it's an exciting matchup. I think everyone will favor Genji in this. But that's the story yeah. of DRX. Yeah. Fandom wise, exactly. everyone's going to favor DRX. You're, DRX you're supposed to good. not predict DRX. Exactly. That's, that makes their you always count them out, right? Even in it's group like Rogue, stage, right? when when it's yeah. like you go to group stage, some people were saying that maybe Rogue and Top Esports, the ones getting out, yeah. is DRX really getting out? Uh, in planes, they were not supposed to finish first in their group either. They beat RNG and they got first in their group. They got out of groups in first place. They beat um, EDG in the in this quarterfinals and a reverse sweep when they weren't supposed to win game three and they lost game two and they were counted out. So yeah. it's it's like the story of being the underdog, never being the favorite, and always being underrated. So I would personally vote Gen G to win this series. <laughs> I would say that they, this could be a 3-0 for Gen Guys, G. Guys, I want to tell you how much I love but, Def, but he's going to lose. But that's that's the power of DRX. The more you doubt yeah. them, the more they get. They, they, yeah. they, they I, I really want to see how the champ select plays out yep. because there's so many variables. Like, it, it's easy to be like, oh, yeah, you know, you just need to ban Zekka. Um, it's also easy to be like, Zekka sure wins both sides of that matchup, but it's like, well... We haven't seen him against Chovy yet. We don't yeah. know how Chovy's going to respond yeah. to that, right? Like, with a lot of the strengths that Zeka has, we still have to see if they're going to manifest against it, Chovy. It has rippling effects because there's so many other important picks right yep. now, too. So, yeah. I'm I, excited. I'll say that I think I across, across, I got a P2. <laughs> across the board, I think we can say with confidence, Genji are the heavy, heavy favorites going into this one. Yep. Stories, plot armor. There's a lot of reasons to be excited for DRX, but between history and the absolute raw consistency, this that podcast has table. gone almost as long as the hours of sleep. Also, that I got last thing, night. Hell yeah. Deft and Chovy have never made a world finals. So, whoever wins this will go to a world finals for their first time ever, which there is you pretty go. exciting. Uh, Someone's going to win no matter what. That's what yeah, I like to hear. Yeah. I, 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 Positives I hope, on both I sides. The heart, my heart says Deft. My head says Chovy. I mean, Deft first them. faker, yeah. world finals. Ooh. Yeah. Well, T1JDG is a lot closer. Yeah, T1JDG. Yeah, we're going to have to find out that one. Okay, so yeah. that's that's where we stand on this one. Um, and I think, given Kobe's bladder and the lack of sleep, we'll close here because it's only going to get zanier. It's only going to get wackier. And hopefully that wackiness continues into the best of fives this weekend. We're kicking things off with T1 versus JDG at 5 p.m. Eastern time. That's 11 p.m. CEST. Of course, thank you for watching. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe on the Law Esports channel for all future episodes. And thank you to Nikolai's Roof for hosting us and Killshot Media for uh, recording our episode here in Atlanta. Tune in, LPL LCK. We'll see if we get an LPL LCK final or if it's LCK all the way fighting for a spot in the grand final. This has been episode three of Dive Forward. Bye. Bye.